Well, thank you very much, Jim, for the nice introduction. And I want to thank you for having me here. And I want to thank also Dr. Goodman for having me here today. It's a great honor. And uh, I'm sorry I confused you with uh, Warren Buffett. Uh, you are lucky in a way. Uh, because if you would be the real Warren Buffett, you would have had to do all the push-ups he had to do when he wanted to talk about increasing taxes in this state. I don't know if you remember that four years ago. I made him do 500 push-ups to punish him for that. And, uh, and every time since then, every time he says anything that is contrary to what I believe, he, he gets punished with some kind of a crazy workout. So I, I'm sure he don't want to be there. Uh, although he won't have his money, right? Yeah, I know it. But anyway, it's uh, great to be here today with all of you. And, uh, you know, I've been uh, going up and down the state of California to uh, talk about our economy, to talk about our budget problem that we have uh, this year and our budget system, how it has failed the state over and over again. And so it is wonderful to be here again and to talk about this subject, a very important subject. Of course, it's not the first time I've been here. I have been here before. I've been here in 2002 talking about my After School Education and Safety Act initiative, which was then on a ballot in 2002 and won overwhelmingly with 57% of the votes. So this place brings me good luck. So this is why I enjoy being back here today and, and talk to you about all of those things. First of all, let me just say to you that uh, um, I love uh, my job. I really enjoy being the governor of the great state of California. I'm a big believer in volunteering. I'm a big believer in service. I'm a big believer in giving back to the state and giving back to your community and giving back to your country. I felt this for the last 30 years. Uh, I think it is extremely important because the action comes from the people. Politicians can only do so much, but the real change comes from within us and from the people uh, in this great country. And so uh, 30 years ago, I was involved in Special Olympics, becoming the coach um, and uh, not only nationally, but internationally, the torchbearer for Special Olympics, which is an organization my mother-in-law started to help people with, that are intellectually challenged. And this is an organization that's all over the world now. And uh, then I got involved with the President's Council on Fitness and uh, because I got really excited about giving back and, and, and doing something that has nothing to do with making money, but where you give something back to the people. And, uh, and traveled through all 50 states promoting health and fitness in this country. And then later on, that got me involved in after-school programs. Uh, and we started establishing after-school programs all over the state of California and then all over the country. And, of course, the initiative, like I said, Proposition 49, passed, which enabled us to have now $428 million more for after-school programs in, in the state of California. And now because of that, every elementary and middle school can apply for grants for after-school programs. So it was a big move forward. And now, of course, it's the ultimate of public service to be the governor of the great state of California and to try to solve the problems every day to get up in the morning and to think about what can we do in order to make the life of, of people in California better, how to improve the economy, and how to really solve some of the major problems that the state has. And of course, there's many problems that the state has, the uh, problems that have been there for decades. And, uh, you know, and we've uh, seen that when I came into office in 2003, the state had a big problem. But even today, let me tell you, we face problems. As, as a matter of fact, um, I don't like the coverage that I see uh, because it's a little bit too negative. I mean, let me just tell you, I enjoyed, when I was doing movies, I enjoyed destroying everything. I mean, I uh, love blowing up buildings and love de destroying cars and wiping out people and all those kind of things. So by the time the landscape was there, it was just everything was burning and everything was a wreck. But now when you turn on the news, you see the same thing when they talk about the economy. But the reality of it is, is it's not that bad. It is bad. Uh, we did go down with the economy, but uh, we're going to be okay in California. And uh, the reason why we are going to be okay, unlike other places, is because we are so diversified. The state is very diversified. We have so many different economies. I mean, if you think about, you know, about Florida, you say oranges. You think about Iowa, you say, you know, corn. And you think about Texas, you say oil. But look in California, what we have here. We have, you know, we are so diversified. You look up northern California, we have the Silicon Valley economy. 
We looked at the Central Valley. We have agriculture, that whole economy, which is huge in California. We come down to Los Angeles, and you have the entertainment industry, that economy. You have in San Diego its own economy with biotechnology and all those things. You have in Orange County its own economy. So this is, we are very diversified, and this is why we never really take as big a hit as other states do. And so this is why I say we are okay. And also you can see with our state revenues, our state revenues are only down from what we anticipated, but they are not down from where we were last year. As a matter of fact, we have an increase in revenues by about 1.5% this year. So we are, we are going to be okay. The key thing is and I totally recognize the fact that a lot of people that are suffering at the same time because the, the housing crisis that we have in the sub-mortgage uh, crisis and all of those things have really uh, created a big hit for people in California. And uh, it is important now that we work and, and help the people. And this is why we have come in very quickly and started uh, coming to an agreement with some of the major lenders to freeze the interest rates in California. So those people that cannot afford an increase in interest rates, you know, they're helped right away. And we set up a, a hotline so that people can call that hotline that will be answered in Spanish and in English. So anyone that has a problems with their, with their home and with, their, with the mortgage, they can call that hotline and get immediate help. We even inspired the federal government and, 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 and let them know that we have made this agreement with major lenders here in California and that, we should, that they should do the same thing on a national level, which they did. Secretary Paulson came in, and he followed through with that. And two weeks after we have made our agreement, they have made their agreement, which has now become part of the stimulus package of the, uh, that they have just proposed. And so I think that it is very important that we react to those things very quickly and that we help the people as quickly as possible. But the situation this year at this time is different with our economic downturn than it was in 2003 when I came into office. And what is different is, is that we are doing things in order to help the situation rather than working against the situation. What the previous administration has done is, and why it was really a disaster in 2003 was, they did the opposite of what you should do. One of the things that they've done is they immediately, when they ran out of money in Sacramento, and as you know, Sacramento loves to spend money, your money, not their money, your money, love doing that. And because of that, they always run into trouble. So what they did was, instead of fix the budget problem and the system itself, they raised taxes, the vehicle license fee tax. Well, that drove people absolutely insane. So you doubled that with, the, you know, giving, uh, you know, a driver's license to undocumented immigrants, which also was done that same year, and then having the, 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 the blackouts and then going to increase taxes. There was really some problems, and not reforming workers' compensation, which was the poison of our economy. I mean, it's a, what, a, what has happened in 2003 was it drove businesses out of the state. Businesses were literally leaving. People were losing jobs. Our credit rating went down because Wall Street looked at our disastrous situation. There was no one managing that money, so our credit rating went down. It was the, the, the worst credit rating in the nation. And so we, we were losing things left and right, and there was only bad news. So when I came into office in 2003, we then reversed those things. We stopped, and the first minute I went into my office, in the governor's office, we rescinded the car tax, and we gave that money back to the people. But this is $4 billion a year that you're talking about now here. Now it is $6 billion a year. It will be $6 billion now. So we are talking about saving the California taxpayer $20 billion now in his last four years. Then we immediately reformed workers' compensation. And we negotiated and negotiated, and we were really tough on that. Because, of course, there were many of them that believed in the status quo and they wanted to keep things in, in, in Sacramento. So we negotiated, and then we finally reformed the system in such a way that now the, 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 the rates are coming down and coming down, but now they're already 63% down our workers' compensation rates from what they were then in 2003. So that saves now the state of California approximately $24 billion altogether. So think about now, we've given back $20 billion in the car tax money, we've given back now $24 billion, that's $44 billion that went back to the private sector, that went back to the taxpayers, rather than collecting more tax money from you. So there's quite a difference. So that stimulated the economy, and it got people back to work, and this is why we have created since then a million new jobs since I've come into office. And we increased our revenues from $76 billion to $96 billion. 
not the $101 billion that we anticipated, but $96 billion nevertheless. And so this is why we have turned things around so that now companies can use that money and hire more people, buy more equipment, expand the companies, and this is why we had economic uh, stimulation here in our state and improved the economy. And this is why it is very important that we continue on in that route. And one of the smartest things that we have done, because as soon as we brought the economy back, was that we said, let us rebuild the state of California. Now, why was this important? It was important because for the last four decades, since Pat Brown, we didn't build anything in this state. That's why you're getting stuck in traffic, because our freeways have not been expanded and improved. This is our levees were vulnerable around Sacramento and Northern California and Central California. We didn't have enough schools. Kids were sitting in overcrowded classrooms, and there was not enough affordable housing. So we sat down, Democrats and Republicans, we started traveling up and down the state and talking about the important issues of rebuilding California. Rebuilding California in such a way so that we are bringing up the infrastructure from 18 million, what it was meant for in the late 60s, early 70s, up to the 37, 38 million dollar, uh, the people that we are right now. So there needs to be a, a lot of building. This is why I say I want to see cranes everywhere in this state. I want to build, build, and build. And so finally, the Democrats and Republicans got together and for the first time in four decades have seriously talked about infrastructure. And they came up with a package of $37 billion, including a $5 billion uh, package for water that was also approved by the people. And so last in November of 2006, the people of California for the first time approved $42 billion of infrastructure. And now we are starting to build our roads again. Now we're building more classrooms, we're fixing up our schools, and we're building more schools. We're expanding our universities and our community colleges, and we're building career tech educational facilities with that money. And finally, we're fixing our levees, that out of 179 vulnerable spots that we have in our levees, over 100 have already been fixed. Our levees are more vulnerable than the levees that we had in New Orleans. And of course, Katrina really inspired everyone in Sacramento to take this seriously and to put $4.6 billion into our levies. So this is not only important, this rebuilding California, because we need that infrastructure in order to live up to 100% of our potential economically. But it is also important that this money is now sitting there, and this is what I talked about earlier, what do we do when the economy goes down? We have to react to that. We have to do something about it, and now we can go and take that un unallocated money, the $29 billion that's still there, and push it out as quickly as possible, because our infrastructure bond money is meant for rebuilding California over a period of 10 years. But instead of waiting and doing it over a period of 10 years, let us push out that money now. Why is that important? Because there are so many people that are unemployed that are normally building homes. But the housing market we know is down. So there's a lot of people that are in the construction businesses, if it is carpenters, if it is steel workers, if it is cement workers, plumbers, and all this, they're out of work now. So now with that public money, we can go out and start building the schools faster, fixing those levees faster, building the freeways faster, the highways, the tunnels, the bridges, the on-ramps, the off-ramps, all of those things we can do much faster. We can pump that money in there and could put people back to work. That is our responsibility. This is what we need to do. So this is why I say it is important not to go and start asking people for more money and raising taxes, which is going the other way. We have to go and put money into the sector and let people get to work and put people to work. Now, it is not, like I said, the, the disaster is we increase jobs every day. And I think that we will see some good positive numbers coming out again for this uh, last month of the kind of jobs that we have created. So I'm not concerned about it, but we still have you know, we have 17 million people that go to work every morning in California. But we still have people that are unemployed. We want to put everyone to work. That is my responsibility. And so I think that the, one of the key things that we want to uh, uh, really take care of here is, is, is to let the world know that California is investing in itself, and because of that, other people should come also and invest. And it's working already. There's more and more money coming into California if it is for green and clean technology. Two billion dollars this last year. Uh, be, uh, uh, you know, a uh, venture capital came into this state, and in biotechnology, there's a lot of money coming in here. 
And, uh, because, and then we have just recently, Wall Street has just written about $22 billion investment of the railroads. They're investing not only all over the United States, but a lot of that money is going right here in California, which would mean that it will be the double amount of, of uh, tracks that we will have and, uh, and, and uh, wagons that would deliver goods here. So all of this stuff is going on here in California. What we have to do now, and what is the important thing is, is we have to now fix our budget system. And I want to talk just a little bit about that. What has happened is, is that every single time that the state has a downturn economically, we run out of money. And the reason for that is, is because we are not keeping a rainy day fund. Now, as you know in business, that is very important. If you have a family, this is very important. Don't spend all your money. Well, Sacramento for decades has always spent all the money. So in 1999, when we had a revenue surge of 23%, they spent all of that money, not one dollar they kept. Spend it all. So when you spend that money, what does that mean? That means that you're basically saying to the people of California, we're expanding all of the programs that we have. We expand on education, we expand on health care for children, we expand on this healthy family program, and all of those programs we expand because we have that money. Well, that means that the next year you have to spend the same amount of money, regardless if the economy goes down or not. So you're obligating yourself and you're setting yourself up for failure. Instead of saying, okay, we can only grow 5%, and the rest of the money we have to keep aside in case the economy goes down again. And this is why I have those charts here. You can see here on this chart, let me just take this mic here. You can see on this chart, we're taking people here on a roller coaster ride. The yellow line here is spending. The green line is revenues. As you can see, those two lines are not related to each other at all. They go off on their own way, rather than keeping those two lines together. So the, the problem is, is that every time we are going down with the economy, we are running out of money. Now that means that we are sending our kids and our vulnerable citizens on a roller coaster ride. And this is exactly what's happening this year. Here I have a chart here for you, so you can see what it would be like if we would have had some budget reform in place. See how the lines come together? Because when we have budget reform, we can bring those together. This is what I'm proposing this year, is budget reform. And uh, I just want to let you know that this is not going to be easy to get this reform because, like I said, in Sacramento, they like to spend money. And so to say to them that the next time we have a surge in revenues, to go and only spend 5% more and the rest of the money we take will be a very a big challenge. And this is why this year I have asked the legislators to do, a, to do three different things. One of the things is to go and make mid-year cuts. And the legislators on the Proposition 58, the legislators had 45 days after I declared a fiscal emergency, which was on January 10th when I did my budget proposal. At that time, I, I challenged the legislators and asked them to go and make the mid-year cuts that we have proposed. And the legislators have done a great job within less than 45 days. They came in actually a week early. They already sent me the proposal. I signed it. I signed the budget uh, cuts, and it's taking effect right now. The second step we have to do is we have to fix now the budget for this coming fiscal year, 2008-2009. It will be a big challenge because that deficit is $16 billion. Now, some of that was helped now with those mid-year cuts. But let me tell you, it's going to be a big challenge, and this is why we proposed a 10% cut across the board. Now, there are some people that say, well, this is not fair. Or the, the, our legislative analyst's office said that I could have done better by just choosing what my priorities are. But you know something that I felt that that would be the more unfair way to go because Republicans have their favorite programs and Democrats have their favorite programs. So I didn't want to go and start picking and say, because I'm a Republican, let's pick the Republican programs and protect them. And the hell with the Democrats, let's just, you know, do them in with their programs and take all the money away from their programs. I didn't think that would be fair. So this is why I said, let's make it cross the board 10% cuts. And this way, let everyone come together, that the legislators go and start working. The Democrats and Republicans should now work together and find a way so we can make the cuts. And if they have uh, certain preferences, they should work that out. I will always be there. My door is always open for them to work uh, together with me and with our office. As a matter of fact, we had yesterday a Big Five meeting. 
where the legislative leaders came down and I inspired them again that it is very important not to wait until July 1 when the new fiscal year starts, because that's what happens a lot of them in Sacramento. They wait until the last minute, and then they start negotiating. But the reason why this doesn't work this year is, is because the cuts, and this is very important for everyone to know, is when we make cuts, it takes months for those cuts to take effect. So if we say let's cut on health care $2 billion, those $2 billion don't start you know, having effect, those cuts, at the next day. It would take months for them to have effect because of the certain laws, federal laws that we have and certain rules that we have and legislation and, and limits. So you can't do that from one day to the next. The same is if you make cuts in, in prisons. It takes you a certain amount of time to lay off prison guards. It takes up to nine months to lay off prison guards. So you can't do that from one day to the next. So there's in law enforcement, it's the same thing. There's certain things that you promise to law enforcement certainly, where you can't make cuts from one day to the next. And so this is why I urge them to go and make the decisions now, because if you make the decisions now, like for instance with teachers, on March, on March 15th, they have to know, the teachers, who is being hired or who is being laid off. After that, it's too late. You can't go anymore in April or May and say to the schools, well, you know, some of you are getting less money now, because they have now hired the teachers. So this is why we have to make decisions now, and this is why I'm urging the legislators to make decisions now. That it takes time, it takes months and months to, make, to really have those cuts take effect. And this is why it is very important for us to work now, especially this next month. Now, they want to wait for the April, uh, uh, for the tax money coming in to see how much money is coming in. We know approximately how much money will be coming in. Yes, there could be a billion more or a billion less, but we know approximately what is coming in. Then they want to wait for the May revise. Well, there, is no, there will be no surprise, nothing unusual. We know that the economy is down and that every month, right now, we are spending 400 to $600 million more than we are taking in. And this is why it is important to make those cuts now and to be fiscally responsible now. And I know it's very hard. I know that behind every number, there is a person that is suffering, a person that gets hurt by that when you make those cuts. I'm very much aware of that. But if we have $96 billion, that's all we have. So, of course, I would like to give away $110 billion. Of course, I would like to have everyone have their programs. But that's all we have. So this is why it is important that we learn how to live within our means. Now, there's a chart here that I have I wanted to just show to you. If we don't make the kind of budget reforms that I'm talking about, we would not get our budget together and we would have billions of dollars, as a matter of fact, 10, 11 billion dollars of deficit every single year for years to come. And the budget reforms that I'm talking about is, is very simple. What I'm saying is, is let us put uh, aside a rainy day fund. And if we still may need to make cuts, let us predetermine of which programs get cut first. This is what other states are doing. I think this is what our state should be doing. The reason why this is important is because when we go and start negotiating the budget, sometimes it takes months to negotiate the budget. And because in Sacramento they can't handle two things at the same time, you only can talk about the budget because otherwise it becomes horse trading. If you're in the middle of budget negotiations, talk about health care reform, they say, well, okay, if you give me this extra $2 billion for this program here, then I help you with health care reform. You don't want to get into that kind of a trading situation. So therefore, you only do budget reform. And so you take out two to three months every year arguing over which programs should be cut and which programs should be funded. So if we decide now, if the economy goes down and we don't have enough revenues, then we make certain cuts, I think it will eliminate all of those problems. If we have the budget reform, then we will have, right now, if we don't have the budget reform, we have this. You can see this is again the yellow line. The yellow lines here, the yellow line represents the spending, the green line represents the revenues. So as you can see, we are, every year we are apart by 10, 11 billion dollars. Now add this all together how much money it is. If we do the budget reform, here I have a chart that shows to you exactly how we will bring those two lines together and we will solve the problem once and for all. So what we are talking about is something that will have a permanent effect, a permanent effect. So there will be a lot of negotiations, like I said, three things. 
One was the media cuts, which they've done. Two is to, 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 to solve the budget problem for the coming fiscal year. And three is to solve the budget system, to, to really fix the system once and for all so that we have a system in place that really works so we don't have to have those debates and we can move forward in a sound way. And the, 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 thing, the reason why I think the idea of what some of them in Sacramento are talking about is raising taxes to fill the gap is not a good idea. It's just because every five years we have this same problem. Every five years we see a downturn in the economy and we see a shortage of revenues. Just five years ago in 2003 we saw the same problem. Under the Wilson administration was the same problem. Under the Duke Major administration was the same problem. I mean, you go down, Jerry Brown faced the same problem. I just talked to him recently. They all faced the same problem. So if we raise taxes, every time we have the same problem, we will be at one point at 100%. This is why I say we cannot tax our way, uh, our way out of this problem. We have to fix the system. We have to fix it once and for all. And I know, as I said, it is tough to do for the legislators because they have their own constituents to go back to and, and, and tell them that, look, I delivered for your program and ours. I know how it works. The good thing is, I have to tell you, and this is the important thing, when I came, into, uh, when I came to Sacramento, Democrats and Republicans were fighting. They couldn't agree on anything. So I said always, I said, the number one challenge I would have is to bring Democrats and Republicans together so they can sit together on the table and understand each other's problems, not just their own problem, but the other person's problem. And I said to myself, I can do that. I mean, I sleep with a Democrat every night. Why shouldn't I, why shouldn't I be able to do that? And you know something? We went up there and we worked together, Democrats and Republicans, and now... We worked hard through all those problems so that we can get along and so we can understand each other. And now they're negotiating. So many wonderful things have been accomplished because of the legisl legislators working together. And I tell you, I'm proud of them. Even though I don't get everything that I want, I totally understand there's 120 different people up there. And I, I don't have to tell you what it is like for every move that you make that you have to ask 120 people. But that's the system. It's not like it's their fault. That's the system. And that's fine. So we just have to, it takes a little longer to get things done. Like I wish I could be here today and say we have gotten health care reform done because health care reform is extremely important because we have, you know, uh, 6.7 million people that are uninsured in this state and we have so many people abusing our emergency rooms, going there because they're uninsured uh, to get their treatments and all this. I wish I could have it done, but, you know, we didn't. We worked a year very hard on negotiating. And then the Senate didn't approve it and it fell apart. Now we go back again and we're going to renegotiate and work on it very hard again because I will, while I'm in office, deliver health care reform because I'm very adamant, very passionate about this subject. So anyway, the bottom line is things are going well. California economy is okay, like I say. The important thing is I learned a lot of my lessons from sports. You know, I worked out at one point in my life every day five, six hours. Many times when I went to the gym, working out, I felt like tired. I felt like I don't want to do it. I can't do it. And then there was a little thing in my brain that said, look at the big picture. Look at the vision. And force you and push your way through it. Push your way through this way of thinking. And I started working out and I started seeing myself as the Mr. Universe and the world champion and the weightlifting champion and the powerlifting champion and all of those things. And I kept pushing through it and doing another set and doing another set of squats and doing this and another set of bench press and another set of chin-ups and doing all those things. And all of a sudden the body woke up again and I started feeling better and I started finishing my five-hour workout. And this happened over and over again throughout the year. Everyone has that. Everyone. As we all get up one day in the morning and say, it's just not happening. But let me tell you something. This is what's happening to the economy right now. It's at that point where, you, where, where things are not happening exactly the way you want it. And this is why what I'm saying here is let's push through it. If we push through that, we will come out again and everything will be just fine. And as I said, I know that some people are suffering, but I think that now is the time to tighten the belt a little bit and to work together for all of us and not to be pessimistic, but to be optimistic because, after all, we are in a golden state. We are in a golden state. This is the best place in the world 
There is no place better. That's why everyone from around the world wants to come here to this state. That's why we have this increase in population all the time. It is a wonderful place. That's why I came also here. Austrian farm boy coming over here trying to make it. And I did make it because it is the land of opportunity. So thank you very much for listening. And I know that now you maybe want to ask some questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. It should be working. Ladies and gentlemen, the governor will be taking questions, and if you will wait until the microphone comes to you, we would appreciate it. Uh, gentlemen back there. Good morning, Governor. Good morning. You know, I canceled my personal workout with my trainer this morning to answer the question. <laughs> you don't need it. Look at your delta. It's all pumped up. <laughs> <laughs> According to the California Energy Commission Integrated Energy Report of last year, the 14 refineries we have are not producing enough gasoline for our current population. We're importing 3.5 million gallons a day with a population growth projected in 12 years, in 2020, we'll be importing an additional 10 million gallons a day of gasoline from foreign countries. When can we expect California to provide economic incentives to increase the petrochemical infrastructure system in California to meet the demands of that population? Well, uh, first of all, let me just tell you, this is part of the uh, infrastructure that, you that I was talking about earlier, where we need to upgrade. But the big dilemma with, when it comes to uh, oil is, as you know, that uh, oil has doubled in price for the, this last year, and we have a real problem because we are saying on one side, that we don't want to import the oil from uh, the Middle East and from other countries. We want to be self-reliant. But on the other hand, when the president asked to drill in uh, Alaska, there was tremendous opposition. And we have also opposition here in California. And I myself am uh, uh, against offshore oil drilling here in California. But we need to build more refineries here in California, and we have to try to do everything we can to explore new ways, new ways of fueling our cars and uh, the fuel and, and create energy. That's why I am... Uh, working very hard also to create 20% of renewables by the year 2010, uh, which is a goal that we set, and that we are getting there, but it needs an extra push. We have, of course, a lot of opposition from environmentalists at the same time, as you know. As soon as we want to build something, even with renewables, even though renewables is something that environmentalists are for, but then when it comes to using the delivery lines to get the energy to the grid, then we have a problem and the whole thing falls apart. So there's a lot of negotiations that need to take uh, place in order to get that done and to, in order for us to reach that goal by 2010. But we will reach that. There's no two ways about it because I will do everything we can to reach that goal. Uh, but we have to uh, you know, look for, um, for other ways of, of fueling our cars. And this is why I celebrate, for instance, Tesla Motors, who is a California company, that are building the first you know, electric car here in California and doing a great job with it. That car is coming out very soon. That's why I'm inspiring Detroit to go and build more hydrogen cars and to build the more hybrid cars and to build the, you know, electric cars and so on. So we don't need to import so much of this fuel and have this kind of problems that you're talking about. And you know, even though Detroit is kind of like uh, fighting me on that, and they have billboards in Detroit saying, you know, Governor Schwarzenegger to Detroit, drop dead. And uh, what I'm saying is to Detroit is not drop dead. What I'm saying is to Detroit, you know, wake up, get off your butt, go and start producing cars with alternative fuels. That's what we want to accomplish here. Okay? Thank you. Yes, back there. Uh, good morning, Governor. Thank you for your, uh, for your time today. It might not look like it, but uh, you and I have uh, something in common. We're both fathers. And uh, we care for our kids, and that is education. Now, I applaud the fiscal responsibility you talked about, but that 10 percent cut treats everything equal. The concern I have is what are, help us through your thought process on what else we can do and what you're planning on doing for the education of our kids. Well, I think that yesterday, for instance, we have announced uh, together with uh, uh, Secretary Chuck O'Connell uh, a plan to help uh, the districts that have fallen behind. As you know, we are doing very well in some schools in California, but we are not doing so well in other schools. And so the No Child Left Behind Act uh, requires 
you know, that if a school district has fallen behind, it was unable to really teach the kids in an appropriate way and, 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 and bring them up to the level where they expect to be, uh, then you, they can cut uh, the federal funding for the school districts. So we don't want that to happen. So in return, what we did was we got together with the school districts and worked together with Chuck O'Connell, uh, the superintendent of public instructions, and in working together and helping those, taking over some of the school districts. And with other districts, there's 97 of those districts that have fallen behind and did not make that bar, that level, or the uh, No Child Left Behind Act is required. Uh, so we are working together with them. We are helping them to rebuild them, and to, which means sometimes to start with after-school programs there, tutoring, more tutoring, homework assistance for the kids, and also retraining the teachers themselves, sometimes even replacing administrators and uh, the leaders, because when it comes to education, the most important thing is leadership, is the school principal. Yesterday we were at a school, at the Northwood uh, uh, Elementary School uh, near Sacramento, and I'll tell you something. This was a regular public school, but they were a jewel of a school. Why? Because the school principal was a great leader. The school principal has created the kind of partnership that you need between the parents, the children, the teachers, and the school principal. They all work together. If a child falls behind just a little bit, the parents are being called in, and they all work together to help this child with tutoring and with various different programs and assisting them with their homework and so on. And so this, what we as a state want to do is we want to help the, the lowest performing schools now first because it's unfair that there are certain children that do not get the equal education in California. And this is why we settled also the Williams lawsuit, which was all about, uh, you know, that they don't, certain schools don't get the equal amount of books, the equal amount of homework material, the equal amount of quality teachers, and so on and so forth. So we settled that lawsuit that now we have put billions of dollars into that program to build up those schools. Yes. Uh, um, hi, um, my name is Brianna Kaufman, and I am a student at North Hollywood High School. Um, as you may know, California is ranked 49th in the nation um, for education, and it is outspended by 42 other, na other countries in the nation. Other states, sorry. Um, the 40, 460 million budget cut um, that you're taking from LUSD um, is a 10% ratio of the entire 4.8 billion that you're taking away from education. And I just wanted to know why you think the California taxpayer wouldn't be willing to pay more in taxes um, for education, and also um, why you can't take more budget cuts from other sectors? Well, uh, first of all, let me just say that I'm very happy to say that right now, uh, as you know, education gets a percentage of our revenues. And so when we anticipated $102 billion in revenues, and uh, we, they got a percentage of that, of that revenue, now the revenues are short. They're falling short. Now education is over-appropriated by $1.4 billion. And we talk to the education community. Normally they would now have to give back to us $1.4 billion, which they're over-appropriated. And we worked out something with them because I feel very passionate about education. Do not cut and take away this one and take back the $1.4 billion. They're over-appropriated but only to take $400 million away and let them keep the billion, $1 billion. Because I know that the challenges they face. So we are working with the education community, but as I said, even though there's Proposition 98, there's only so much money that we have, and therefore there's only so much money we can spend on those programs and invest in those programs. Now, granted that we have seen our studies on education, that education ought to have more money. You're absolutely correct. And so this is why I'm working with the Education Coalition. If they ever want to go to the people and ask for more money, and the people vote yes, I will support that 100%. But that is something that they have to be put on a ballot, and they go and ask the people for that question. But right now, in the meantime, we have only the $96 billion, and I cannot promise them more than we have. Okay? Yes. Can the lady have the microphone? Wait. Thank you. Okay, please. Good morning, Governor Good morning. Schwarzenegger. <laughs> My name is Sherry Schreier, and um, I'm from Happy Hats for Kids and Hospitals. But my question to you is, I read in the paper that the luxury yachts and RVs 
are not being taxed. I would like to know why. Well, because you have some of my colleagues in Sacramento that are very strong in lobbying for keeping that. Now, may I remind you, you see here, even though I'm a Republican, but I'm a big believer that when we have a financial crisis like this, that we all should chip in. And this is why I uh, totally agree with the legislative analyst, uh, analyst's office when she says that we should look at tax loopholes. We should look at those seriously. She has identified $2.5 billion of tax loopholes, including the, the, the yacht tax is one of them. I think that we should go after those tax loopholes because we need – we would need the extra $2.5 billion. This is $2.5 billion we can give straight to education. I'm totally for that. So I totally agree with you, what you're saying when you question it. And I agree that we should go for it and we should do it because everyone has to give something in order to make this work. Well, it's, uh, you know, negotiating. It's, it, what will happen in these next few uh, weeks and months is where the Democrats and Republicans will sit down and start talking about it and they will be looking at it and saying to themselves, look, there's only so many cuts we can make. Let us protect education, let's say, because there's a lot of people that believe the same as I do, that we should protect education as much as possible because our children are the most vulnerable citizens and they don't have lobbyists in, in Washington or in Sacramento. They, we don't, they don't have the chance to fight for themselves the way other companies have, the oil companies and the car companies and all of those different uh, the industries. So this is why I say let us fight for them and let us work. So everyone will recognize out of the $16 billion cuts that have to be made, you know, why not go also and find a way of creating some revenues like, for instance, uh, with, with, with tax cuts. This will be the with, last with, with question. We'll be closing the tax loophole, I mean. Yes. This will be the last question. A question about AB 32 and controlling greenhouse gas emissions, cutting greenhouse gas emissions to 1990 levels by 2020. What's your view on adopting a cap-and-trade program for California? And second part, if we do have a cap-and-trade program, what should we do about the impact of buying allowances on our Southern California utilities like LADWP that get about half their electricity from, from coal? Right. Well, first of all, let me just say that uh, we are very proud that we have passed AB 32 and frame poverty who was the person and uh, Speaker Nunes, they, both of them were responsible for getting that done and for uh, negotiating with us and that we could do it in a bipartisan way and then also go out and declare victory in a bipartisan way and now rally all the companies together and make them comply with those uh, regulations, I think was huge. And then in California, when we do something, as you know, it doesn't only have the effect on our state, but it has an effect on the whole country. Because since then, there was several other states that came in and wanted to become partners and became partners. There's provinces in Canada that became partners. And then we were asked by the European Union to come over and to sign a cap and trade agreement with European nations, with all 27 of them, which we did last fall. So this has been really huge, this whole thing, and a huge success. Now we just have to implement it. We have to make sure that we are, in fact, rolling back our greenhouse gas emissions by, the, uh, by uh, 2020 to the 1990 level. And then an additional 80 percent by the year 2050. And also that we have to go and do the cap and trade. As you know, that there was a big debate over should we just do the cap and not the trade. I made sure that when I signed AB 32 that there was a cap and trade so that if someone cannot make the goals at a certain time, they can go and trade, they can go and pay for that and then give money to someone that is maybe, you know, further ahead and give them a financial incentive. So this was the whole idea and this is something that other states are doing now and I think it's going to work out really nicely. It is new. You know, like Great Britain has been doing that uh, since uh, 1997 and... Uh, it then started uh, uh, you know, actively in, uh, just you know, two, three years ago, and they had stumbles and they uh, had problems there, but they're ironing out their problems with the cap and trade. We are learning from their mistakes that they've been making. So I think that the whole thing is going to be really terrific, and we're going to clean the air, we're going to fight global warming, but at the same time, we're going to protect the economy because of the, of the trade mechanism. That's the key thing, as I always said. We must take care of our environment. 
we must clean our water. We must make sure to clean our air. We must make sure that we fight global warming. But at the same time, we must make sure that our economy continues to boom. And this is why green, clean technology has been such a huge success in California. And that's why venture capitalists pumped in $2 billion already. And those numbers will go up every year. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking the governor of the state of California. Thank you.